I do not only oppose reparations for slavery in America, the apartheid system, because it's immoral. I also oppose it, you know, much more excited about opposing it because it will not work. One thing I'm impressed with is how dedicated the Democratic Party is on remaking America in their image. The Democratic Party ensures, ensures social policies that support destroying traditional America, Orthodox Christianity, individual liberty are fought for and implemented year after year. They're willing to lose elections for decades. They're willing to have a 20 year program on turning Texas blue. They're willing to fund activists to be online. Do you see the RNC? What state is the RNC trying to turn red? Where is their 20 year funded program out of their tens of millions of dollars on remaking a single state? They're just on their back feet, always on defense. The Republican Party likes to focus on things like tax policy and making sure the people don't smoke that Mexican marijuana. That's what literally spends a lot of the Republican time. They're always on defense. The Democratic Party, as they continue to win because they're always on the offensive, all they do is seem to f move further and further to the left. You know, they've had a lot of success, so they're, they're doing what you would do. You start swinging for the fences. They are becoming more, the Democratic Party is becoming more and more extreme, and all the Republican Party can do is be against this, be against that, tell people why, you know, oh my goodness, uh, we, we, we can't, we can't, you know, we're against that. And then the, the Democrats get to respond and go, hey, well, you, you don't have a policy for socialized medicine. Give us your policy for socialized American medicine. And then the, 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 the Republicans quickly run out and go, hey, we can create a socialized government program also. Do you hear the RNC presenting white papers why reparations for black Americans are wrong? Do you see the Republican National Committee, you know, providing data and information out to uh, elected officials and explaining to them why reparations won't work? You don't. Are they on YouTube with guys hired or whatever promoting this? They don't. Tens, hundreds of millions of dollars, and they can't even advertise on conservative YouTube channels. The RNC is useless, absolutely useless. So thus it falls to, to, create, to, to just one-off guys like me who have tiny offices, uh, audiences, please like and share if you value this content. Please get it out there. I think we uh, are going to hit uh, 1,500 subscribers soon, and, and I appreciate each one of you. Um, thank you very much. So please, you know, thumbs up on this and all that jazz because it really does help, and it really does help me produce more content when I see you guys out there in, in interacting with it. But... These guys, the RNC doesn't do this, so it falls on guys like me to t explain to you why reparations are immoral and why reparations will not work. Everyone who participated in slavery is long dead. Everyone that experienced sh uh, slavery in America is also long dead. Yes, you can honestly say that perhaps reparation should have happened after slavery. That's probably the biggest moral failing you have. Well, one of the big moral failings about reparations is that after slavery, yes, every enslaved African should have been, you know, given 40 acres and a mule. You could have easily done that, even, even if you didn't take existing property, which there's a, a reason to say that you could have. You could have spread black people out all among the new territories. Here, the government's going to give you 40 acres in this homestead and a mule, and five chickens and a fence and good luck. That would have changed America probably for the better. But that's one thing people say, you didn't do the right thing at the opportunity. Now it's dec you know, generations later and people going, well, you know, just because you didn't do it then doesn't mean you can't do it now. But still, who, who's, who are you going to penalize? Who are you going to penalize for this? Because the people who did this are gone. The effects of slavery today is at best a controversial subject. How much of it impacts black America is, in my opinion, way up for debate. I'll give you an example. Progressives and liberals like to claim that under chattel slavery, blacks were actively prevented from forming families, getting married and caring, uh, caring for their children, which is somewhat true. That's very true. At, the, at any time, a black uh, father and a black of oh, heck, most black fathers didn't know who their children were because they were just bred. I mean, basically, um, the um, uh, black Americans are a bred race to be physically um, as, as, as efficient and effective uh, as possible. So black fathers didn't even know who their children were. And, uh, and a mother could lose her kid at any time. You'd send the mother off for a, uh, some chore and then so that she wouldn't be screaming. You'd just snatch her kid and sell her, sell her child, her, her, her child to someone else. That was really, dis really evil stuff. 
um, just to sell off some debt. Uh, and they claim, but they claim that this past, this chattel slavery shattered the concept of family bonds among black people. I mean, remember slavery, and it's true what they say is right. Slavery has been has been legal in the United States longer than it has been illegal. Chattel slavery for Africans lasted a long time, and then after that came Jim Crow. Yet these, you know, these all sounds good, and if you just paint the top of it, you know, you, you paint over the rust with a little bit of shiny paint, but don't really chip out the rust. It it, it looks good. Yet the, after the end of slavery, blacks had a very high marriage rates and less divorce rates. Between 1950 and 1998, the percentage of never married white women age 15 and over rose from 20 percent to 22 percent, a 10 percent increase. But the percentage of never married African-American women from 1950, long after slavery had been over, doubled from 21 to 41 percent. That's insane. That's long after. So in other words, after slavery, we had way more marriages and way fewer women of never married status. And then after that, the, after that, the rates have start going up by this one statistic, apparently around 1950s. In 1960, 61% of blacks were married um, in, um, in 1960. But by, ni- by 2008, it was um, only 32% of blacks were married, from 61% in 1960 down to 32% in 2008. In other words, it's, at 1960, it's long after slavery is gone. Uh, blacks also get divorced more often, and once we get divorced, we are way less frequently than whites to try to get remarried. In his 1965 research report, The Negro Family, The Case for a National Action, Daniel Patrick Moyhan, a social, uh, social scientist who later became a U.S. senator, argued that the high poverty rates among blacks were in a significant part due to deformed cultural values that were deformed long after slavery. After the difficult historical experiences, he argued, black women preferred matriarchal families, and their values contributed disproportionately high rates of childbearing outside of marriage. In return, large families without fathers led to social ills such as crime, joblessness, poverty, and overdependence on big daddy government, i.e. welfare. Thus, why have marriage rates nosedive, divorce rates skyrocket, and never married single motherhood exploded in the black community after the 1920s? This suggests that, you know, it wasn't between 18, what, uh, 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 1865 or so to 1920 was the biggest problem. It's happened after 1920s and apparently around 1950s and further. People who say that this is simply a legacy of slavery are not studying the issue at all. Trying to say that all problems or even the majority problem, the majority of problems now are caused by historic chattel slavery before 1865 is simply not accurate. The majority of the reasons that people are richer or poor is that there are people who are better with money than others. Here's a true fact that I truly believe in. If you came to America and took everything, you said, hey, Alex, you're king for the day. We want you to implement this policy. I will fairly strip every single American of all their wealth, all their money. I won't let anybody transfer anything overseas. Everyone loses all their property. And then I'm going to take that and I'm going to divide it up perfectly even, even. Everyone gets this. Uh, Let's say that everyone ends up with $100,000 cash in the bank. In a few years' time, there would then be those who are rich and those who are poor. Here's another concept of why this stuff is immoral. 27.3% of black households earn income between $25,000 and $50,000. 15.2% of black households in America earn between $50,000 and $75,000. 7.6 percent of black households earn seven, between 75,000 and 10, 100,000, and 9.4, less than 10 percent of black households earn more than what households, by the way, not individuals, households earn more than 100,000 dollars a year. Thus, you would assume that we would be taxing approximately 58 percent of black households, you know, those who make 25,000 dollars or more, to pay for reparations for the 42 percent of blacks who earn less than 25,000. Or would black Americans be taxed to pay for their own reparation? The black households that make more than $100,000 would be paying taxes and then get reparations, so they're just cycling their own money back through. Or would middle and upper class blacks be getting reparation at all? Another reason why this is unworkable, 
or immoral is go ahead and define to me black America. Go ahead. Define it. A case study uh, based upon 23andMe data showed that 1.4% of white America, people who are walking around going, I'm white, actually carry uh, 2% African DNA. Now, that's very small. It's very small. Only one point, you know, not even 2% of white Americans unknowingly carry 2% African DNA. But they do. And if you said everyone who, who experiences slavery gets it, then would a bunch of you would remember 1.4 percent of white America is actually million. I think it's like almost three million people because you know whites are still the dominant race in America. So like let's say it's two million. Like would two million people, two million white people, would be getting black uh, African reparations because they can they have two percent of African DNA? Oh no. Well okay now you have to define what being a black America is. Currently one out of one out of ten one out of ten white people marry, quote unquote, out of their race. So you're telling me that their kids would qualify for reparations in 2019, in the 21st century. That's insane. Well, Alex, well, tell me how this would work. So first of all, I would stop trying to say that you would try to provide reparations for slavery. That's so long past that there's entire groups of white and black people who have immigrated to the United States after slavery is outlawed. And generally, Jim Crow's over. So a white person who came here who never benefited from Jim, Jim Crow, let's say he lived never, his family can prove that they never lived in a state that, that was in Jim Crow. They have to pay reparations. That doesn't make any sense. You're penalizing an entire group of people for the actions of a few. Same like thing other people do. Hey, look, blacks have higher amounts of criminality, so we should do this to all black people. People do that on both sides, by the way. But, um, you know, I would actually say a more authentic discussion would be to look at the impact of the American apartheid system. That's much more in recent past. That apartheid system was, of course, called Jim Crow. That, that Jim Crow system did not really end truly till like the 1960s. And there are still people who are alive who were born under Jim Crow. My, my mother was born and raised initially under Jim Crow. It was a pretty evil system. I mean, it was very evil. The impact, the impact of the American apartheid system to everyone may be less controversial because it's not that old. Uh, but, okay, so you're saying, how does it work? So, but then you go look at affirmative action, right? Affirmative action is not very popular. Gallup just released a, uh, a study, uh, not just released, but Gallup did a study that said that 75% of whites say you should not be able to use race on college admissions, only merit. And that's cool. And I don't understand that. Well, that's fine. You would expect that. 75, so 25% of whites believe that you can use race in, in, um, in college admission. But 75%, an overwhelming majority say that race should not be used. And people say that all the time. Yet what you may not be aware of is that 59% of Hispanics also say that you should not be able to use race on college admissions. And guess what? 44% of black Americans also agree that you should not be able to use race on admissions. Only 48, not even a majority of black Americans say that race should be considered on college admission. Thus, how, do we, how would I do it? I don't know, man. If you wanted to look at real reparations, I would be refocused on some system of opportunity, which is strictly focused on the people who can show that both their parents experienced Jim Crow, because I think slavery is too old, and there has to be an economic element to it. For example, your household uh, or your parents' household made less than $25,000 a year. So both your parents came from, uh, from uh, Americans who, and now Jim Crow and American apartheid system was a despicable system. And once again, it was run by the governments, many of the states in the South and also the federal government implemented apartheid systems, which economically disenfranchised and, and, and annihilated black households. So you go to that and you say, okay, if you can show me that both your parents come from here, that's great. We're going to give you whatever. But it's not money. It's more of, you, again, you, you, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach a man a fish and you feed him for a much longer time. We know what works, right? So you, you graduating from high school or technical school, don't have children before you're married, but get married, but don't have children before you're married. But if you get married, get married and stay married, but after tw the age of 21, especially if you're a woman, the easy, uh, the average, the average black woman in America, they said her net worth, you know, debts, uh, uh, assets or debts minus assets or assets minus debt. They said it's five bucks. A black woman who's married, her, her, her assets, $30,000. 
It's like, I mean, $30,000 is much less when you look at, you know, they always compare it to white people. Look at white people. Okay, everybody's coming up at their own speed, and it's good. But going, so they're going to say $30,000 is nothing to compare to a, a white family who typically has like 200000 in equity, and that's mostly because of a house. I mean, if you take the home out of it, all these numbers come snapping right back much closer to each other. But, you know, yeah, sure, $30,000 doesn't look good to the $200,000 of a white family, but I'll tell you this, $30,000 is a lot more than five, Okay. So we know what works. So what you would do is you'd build some kind of program or assistance uh, to teach that, okay? Um, they, would have to, they would have to take a look at this. And by the way, I've seen this in other countries. I've seen after-school programs where they were sitting around telling, teaching poor women, um, you know, you have to set time away in, in home to let your children do uh, homework. You need to turn off the TV and the tablets if you let, you know, to let the children do homework. They were t- they were literally had after school programs where mothers were invited in to, to, to teach them these th- these these things, because if you can teach these women, I mean, where's the after school program saying black children watch like four or five times more or I mean, whatever it is, w- watch a lot more screen time than white Americans. Where's that screen time? Where, where's that teaching? Why don't they have programs like that where they bring it in and say, here you go? Why, why, isn't, that, why isn't that funded? Why isn't, why isn't people doing that? Because, see, that's not money. That's actually teaching a man to fish, trying to encourage um, great behavior. One of the programs I saw, that was one of the programs I saw overseas. Another program I really thought that was really cool that I had direct experience with in my life uh, was uh, the military was trying to encourage military officers, but the military is not about putting stupid people uh, or people who are not capable into high position. So what the military did, which I thought was fascinating, instead of using affirmative action to get into colleges, what the military did is they were, and the military has a thing, they want my, various minorities to be in various places because they don't want all their special forces guys to be blue eyed and blonde hair and trying to creep around Africa. They want some of their special forces guys to be black so they can creep around Africa, right? That's what they do. So they were trying to improve that. You know what they did? This is a great policy. So instead of putting a firm faction in college, they funded essentially like a year of community college. It was a year of community college, but it wasn't community college. It was basically a year reworking your high school so they, they they you tested in and then when they looked at your test they said okay you're low in all this and so you had to go in this case as the military you had to go live there be disciplined be on time and the, and basically they were teaching you how to do homework how to study they were teaching you um they were redoing all your math not all of it but you know they're strengthening the math stretching your english and they went through this whole thing for a year so that by the end, your test scores, your P- PSATs and, you know, your, your, your remedial stuff was huge. You made huge jumps. And then they would just let you go apply as everyone else to school. But that whole extra year of preparing you for higher education was huge. That's so much more valuable than just giving you, a, 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 you know, plus 20 percent to get into college. If you had this, it was almost like a boot camp. It's almost like a, uh, I don't know, like what, what are those finish? It's a finishing school. That was it. Right. Where the women would go after high school and they would go to finishing school where they would actually learn how to do and, and act in public. Well, this was a finishing school for, well, college, people going to college. So finishing schools for men and women, you know, that is some ideas. And, and you would focus that, right? You'd be like, okay, if you can demonstrate that you came from this kind of background, if you experienced Jim Crow, if you're poor, then we're going to try to help teach you what works to get people out of poverty. The progressive left always uh, sends in unworkable and socialist, insane socialist ideas. It's in my opinion that they they do this, they put these ideas out, especially for minority communities, not to improve these communities, but to keep the community poor and shackled and to buy votes. They know sprinkling a whole bunch of money around the ghetto is not gonna freaking improve anybody's life, but it'll get votes. It'll get people going, oh, you gave me freaking, you know, a bunch of money. If you're gonna do something, it has to be completely focused on American citizens who experience Jim Crow. It has to have an economic ele- element to it so we're not rewarding wealthy Americans. You know, these you obviously don't need that much help. And by the way, one of the most important things would have some type of sunset provision. Sunset provision where it, you know, give us 50 years or 40 years, I don't care how many years, but I don't care, but get, it, it, it's over on some time. I really think that as a country, we need to get past our, our uh, you know, get a past our legacy. We need to work. Nothing's all fair. Nothing's fair. Whites, poor whites are suffering. Everybody's suffering. But we really need to do our best to get past this, this past. 
this, this legacy. Um, by the way, uh, I have created a new site. It's not really launched yet. You'll see some um, stock photos that I haven't uh, purchased yet, but I'm trying to lay them out and try to get them going because come to find out stock photos. I don't use stock photos a lot in my blog. It's text heavy, but I've kind of put up my uh, thoughts on race relations at anglicanus.com. That's A-N-G-L-I-C-A-N-U-S.com. Uh, a link will be in the a description below. And it's just my, it's a new concept of race and my thoughts on it. Uh, you can throw it away in the trash can, of course, because uh, it's just thoughts. But I'll tell you, unlike what the progressive left does, it's an idea, a new and different idea or a new take on an old idea. Of course, that's usually how it works. But um, I really think uh, that we need to do something uh, new. The, what they're proposing won't work and they basically will know it, know it won't work. Uh, if you enjoyed the content, please like, subscribe, and share. Please give me that thumbs up uh, on the video. That really helps me and uh, helps the video out a lot. And, and share the video. Uh, as you know, YouTube generally uh, keeps uh, conservatives and minority conservatives especially from being uh, natively just kind of growing. Uh, so the only way that we really grow is you kind of send the links around and tell people to take a look at it. So thank you very much and have a good one. Viva Crystal Ray, Viva Crystal Ray, Viva Crystal Ray, either Virgin or Guadalupe. All the things I find strange.